Okay, here's AI first engineering, and we're looking at health and medicine. And in this lesson, we're looking at various ways that uh, AI and possibly more generally high tech is tackling the coronavirus. In an earlier lesson, we heard how how coronavirus was making waste of our of our lives, but now we're looking at uh, moving forward and trying to address the problem. So here is an interesting snippet I found about a robot, um, which I think is uh, an interesting harbinger, because it again comes back to uh, telehealth graining in importance. So here the robot is basically measuring patients breathing with a stethoscope and sharing results with clinicians. So this is a classic telemedicine application. Um, we didn't have robots, but when we I was working in 1994 in this area, this is the type of thing we were studying. And um, say it didn't take off then, it's going to clearly have value at the moment. How much of it stays in the future, we'll have to see. But I think it's quite likely, because it's pretty solid technology. And now with drones and so much better networking and AI, what failed in 1994 could certainly work now. Here we're uh, discussing in this next two slides is Dr. Spot, who is a, who is a robot, which basically is equipped with lots of monitors and is enabled to do an analysis, say, for patients in an ante room. So you come to the doctor, so rather than being face to face with your either has a space problem or time problem, or just a pandemic problem. Uh, it uh, can do the, the analysis uh, of the patients in a, in a clean remote site and send the information and interact with the doctors. And here's the types of things it can measure, skin temperature, respiratory rate, heart rate, blood oxygen. And these are things with partly, some of these are actually ones which these uh, um, monitors, smartwatch, and related monitors also do. And um, it so far is uh, clearly a research vehicle. And on the next slide, we have a nice picture of it uh, showing the team all in their masks. And here is Dr. Spot. There we are. And uh, you can see uh, it's all equipped with a tablet ready to do a real time analysis. And so the doctor can speak to the patient through the tablet. So that's Dr. Spot, thank you. All right, here is a straightforward but important application. We've already stressed that imaging is the most uh, advanced of the AI applications because you can take ex explicitly take existing solutions and modify them to existing image processing solutions, say developed for the car industry or surveillance industry or face recognition and so on, and uh, <coughs> adapt it to, uh, instead of uh, recognizing panda bears, to recognize uh, the virus. And so this is uh, not surprising, this company was able to do this. It's still important, even if it's not surprising. And um, notice this data, there's not that much data, 157, so uh, even the people at the leading edge are not finding it that easy to get huge samples of data. There ought to be a lot more. That's a weakness of this world we live in. We somehow don't share critical data. Um, and I gather it's actually being used across the world, China, Italy, Russia. Um, and there is a uh, another comment here about a different uh, system from China. In general, this is bound to work. I'm not saying this is the perfect solution, but we are so good at deep learning for imaging, uh, and uh, we ought to always be able to do at least as well as humans, possibly better. All right, here is another general type we'll come back to later on, the chatbot world. Um, so Siri is basically able to interact with users and give them guidance as to what situation they're in. That's just called triaging to see who should go to the emergency room, who should just keep calm, and so on. And uh, of course, Siri has to be taught to do this. And so you train 
this is sort of an expert system like application. You have a set of, you ask questions, you listen to answers, and with each answer you have a response. As well as that, um, we know the, I know well the High Performance Computing Consortium, which is a collection of computers to put, to, to bring to bear on studying this problem. Um, <coughs> And here it mentions that Siri is going to reach across 100 million iPhone users. That's actually quite interesting. That's a lot of iPhones. Um, okay. Because as in the notes here, that uh, presumably Siri is not going to propagate fake news. Hopefully it propagates real news. Because it's otherwise people are going to, you can quite easily get misled if you just read the web. Uh, here is a seemingly a rather low-key, lower-end uh, tool, to, which is with an important goal, which is uh, obviously the healthcare uh, community workers are really suffering in this thing because they're working their heart out, and it's, it's sort of a danger, very dangerous job. And so this is a tool which is um, from a startup, which basically monitors healthcare workers and. Uh, Tries to pre-identify uh, the the virus uh, infection, and this is one of many such tools. But as it's stressed here, this one is aimed at healthcare workers because John Hopkins has a wonderful medical school, and so they're well prepared to uh, um, to to uh, develop this. And we all know that the PPE is a new term we've come to learn. And uh, there isn't so much of it, and so we have to we have to make certain people, all these people without enough PPE, uh, are given as much warning and care as possible. All right, so here is a news item that Amazon Care, which is uh, exploits Amazon's wonderful uh, delivery capabilities, is working with uh, Seattle. Research activity, which is trying to understand the virus, and it's uh, picking up and delivering Corona test kits. And this particular activity is supported by Gates. And we all know that um, we have a shortage of testing in the US. And this particular place is actually where one of the earliest um, outbreaks happened, King County, although it recently has not been as fortunately for them has not been as uh, uh, as serious as, uh, say, New York City and other places in the country. Um, here is a, another chatbot example. We heard about Siri. Here we're using uh, Microsoft's uh, healthcare bot. And it's um, an online chatbot, which is system checking. That seems to me exactly like the case we heard about Siri earlier on. And um, we noticed already that we expect chatbot software to be in, which is all effectively AI based. The chatbot is not AI. I mean, the, the way the chatbot responds is all governed by AI. Um, and triaging is just tell, telling you how to prioritize and decide what to do. So this is CDC, the central government organization disease control. All right, so here is a more um, general comment on chatbots, which um, in the previous, some well, much earlier um, lectures, we noted that chatbots in uh, actually in the retail area were very expected to be very important. And they were sort of increasing in use. And this is, uh, this is, these are one of the technologies or approaches that will be enhanced by the virus. And um, there, there here we have um, jumps in use by, by uh, various industries, such as the airline industry, which must get lots of terrible calls about people wanting to know what to do, and the hotel industry. And so we expect chatbots to get this increase in chatbot use probably to continue, although I'm not such a fan of chatbots myself. But um, 
they're probably, they, they, they must, if you have good enough AI, they can certainly even outperform the vast majority of humans, and you can't afford to put real experts at the other end of a phone call, or uh, the other end of a, a chat, an actual chat window on the web. So I, I think I, my negativity is not appropriate. This is a pretty important area, which if done well, will have huge impact. Uh, okay, so here we have um, diagnostic solutions being brought to the market by Amazon. And I assume this is just a providing cloud computing time to develop diagnostics. And clouds are very suitable for this type of problem, because you're not running giant programs, you're running lots and lots of little programs as you run your software on individuals. So this is perfectly suited for clouds, not the right thing to run on supercomputers or university systems. And um, here is a much more academic example of big tech working with, um, in this case, a company, Adaptive Biotechnology, which is um, basically studying the immune system. Because we know the virus, coronavirus, actually its problem is it tweaks the immune, it stimulates the immune system, and the immune system responds with such vigor that it actually destroys things it shouldn't destroy. This is a well-known problem, which I mentioned I had this that particular one particular disease of this type, the Guillain-Barré syndrome, many many years ago, and um, so it's a so. But that, and there's going to be a lot of work of this type. This is work in fundamental biology or computational biology, and which is going to try to understand how the human body responds to this virus and related viruses, because this is obviously going to tell you what type of vaccine to develop. To develop. And in fact, at the moment, they're looking at that, you know, they're trying to identify drugs. If you understood the interaction of the virus with the immune system better, you'd have a much, you'd be able to narrow down your drugs. So this is coupled with the things we'll actually mention later on, which just explore the space of possible drugs. And then that space of possible drugs, you design your drug, which you specify in terms of its chemical compounds, and then you see how it interacts with the virus or with the immune system. We've actually seen this plot before, so I won't go through it again. It tells you more broadly what big tech is doing in healthcare. We already noticed that data security is present for all of them, and they have different strengths, which are actually the same as in the last plot. So I won't go through it. This is it's a useful plot. They're all very fragmented, um, but that's maybe not so bad, because this field needs a fragmented approach, because there is no one solution. You need AI to really spread pervasively, and that will only do it work if you do it in a, in a um, rather scattershot fashion. You just have to be systematic in your support of this area. So here we have a Three uh, news about three particular uh, companies. Here we have a clinical trial for a possible virus, a vaccine. Sorry, and um, this this actually I gather used Amazon clouds, and it took 40 days. Exact. I don't actually know what the. Um, I mean, it would be. It's sort of clear what they could be doing. They could have. They must have a set of drug candidate drugs that they were work, working on, and then they just run on the cloud programs to check how these candidates um, interact with the virus, because you can make a model for the virus, and then they choose the best of those candidates. Um, then, um, well, um, here was a sort of collaboration, but uh, so this is, again, a company that has a vaccine very early. And then presumably it must be pretty similar type of thing to what I suggested Moderna was doing. Here we have another one in June. Okay, so I think we don't know whether this will succeed at all. Because there are other people who say it will take 12 to 18 months to have a vaccine. Well, I sure hope it's over in 12 to 18 months. Here we have a, just a rather obscure, maybe slightly 
due, uh, funny announcement about this insure, health insurance startup developing a website. Well, that's obviously useful. It's uh, interesting. It's run by uh, one of the one of the relatives or some of the connections to the Trump family. And um, actually, I'm surprised. It's actually working with the Affordable Care Act, which is not the favorite act within the Trump administration. Um, so in general, anything like this, which is enhancing the web interface that people can interact with, has to be a good idea. So independent of the, the, the nature of this company, and what it's doing seems to be important. And now here we have a slightly different section on remote work technology. Where um, we'll cut here we have at the bottom Zoom, which we all know. Um, actually, since this was written, we have a big security panic. I actually have not seen any security problems, but the, the people that they've got really are not attacked. I don't know whether it's just actually a real attack or just a, or maybe just people like to make trouble or whether it is a serious problem. Obviously, the Zoom has lots of video streams and audio streams and linked uh, across the world, you can be more or less secure about whether those uh, interactions can be hacked or not. And uh, it is probable that when they were a quiet, sleepy company, nobody paid any attention, and now the hackers around the world have found a very visible thing to attack. Um, so here is a round, which seems to be a variant of Zoom with a somewhat different user interface. Where people occur in circular icons, you know. You often get circular icons on web pages, and uh, those people float around the screen. Well, I'm, maybe that's a good idea. Here we have an online meeting company. Um, and it has um, 18,000 people waiting to use that technology. And so it's trying to replicate an offline event. This, I think, is a good idea. Because although it's relatively obvious how you do it with, say, Zoom and, and Slack and things like that, that's different from doing it. And there are lots of, because um, you have to have a website attached to the, the, to the meeting. And there are all sorts of, uh, it's sort of non-trivial to put together a meeting. And uh, I suspect there is a good business to be made by supporting the, the, the range of functions needed with online meetings. Well, Run the World, that's got a nice name. Um, it has a similar um, goal. And it's um, running online lectures, conferences, and festivals. That's what we like to see. Interestingly, free conference call, and you would have thought, I might have even thought that company had disappeared. It is the, one of the dominant uh, telephone conferencing systems. And um, it has soared in use, which is sort of interesting, because in my world, we, don't, we have a few telephone conversations, but not so many. Slack is a, a messaging system. And um, has uh, obviously is very active. Um, <coughs> whether it's interesting, Zoom actually did not report skyrocketing earnings. It's reported skyrocketing unearnings because it had it had a free service. Slack must have been a little more careful about how they made their offerings, so people weren't allowed to do them for free. Um, and. Um, Slack is well known, and many of my colleagues strongly favor Slack. Here we have GrowWork, which is um, basically a home office um, company, which is also pretty interesting. You can rent a home desk or a chair or supplies. And um, has a tenfold surge in customers. That's not too surprising. This is a good business. They chose the right business. Here is a recent slide uh, on Slack and its performance through the end of July. It has, uh, it is like many of these technology companies, increasing its um, 
revenue and um, but however it actually was not treated very well by Wall Street because compared to Zoom which had some huge increase and actually Teams has a huge increase, Slack did, had a good increase, namely it did add as many customers in six months that in uh, it has as it had in the previous year, but um, more was expected because they were living in a world which should have really wanted Slack uh, capabilities. There is a perception that Slack is not cannot survive, succeed due to the competition with Microsoft Teams. I actually have no idea how Slack compares to Teams in its uh, area. With I mean, Teams has other things, as video as well as uh, chat, but chat is the most uh, Use part of Teams, and uh, I say it's uh, there are all sorts of um, um, was it legal things brewing to as unfair competition and things like that. I I know my, that's but here you can see accelerating customer growth. So this the sister analysis is quite positive, but uh, that's uh, it's not quite clear that everybody thinks that. So that's Slack. Discusses some video conferencing, Zoom, WebEx, which is discussed here, and related technologies. And uh, it points out that uh, two couple of sort of um, modest enhancements. Babel Labs was uh, acquired by WebEx. And I, we've discussed from time to time the importance of the codex and, the, and also especially for audio. Because as I said, uh, the thing that people remember most is not typically the uh, uncertainty in the images, it's the uncertainty in the audio. Because the human ear is terrible at uh, removing noise. And we know that uh, you know, when you're typing, Doing uh, doing uh, Zoom, they have they have clever technology to remove the typing noise and things like that. But in general, high quality codecs, noise removal, and and other aspects of speech announcement are very important. They are possibly the thing that is the most lasting uh, measure of the quality of the audio video experience. And here we have Captivo, which is a slightly different technology. It's a digital whiteboard technology, which is a useful but not quite such dominant uh, tool. But uh, uh, if you have a video conferencing system with a better digital whiteboard, that is certainly um, <coughs> non-trivial. So these are areas where we can expect continued work. There's, you can probably always improve that code. In fact, AI, Almost certainly can do some codec improvements, or sort of automatically can somehow learn how. To, you should be able to have adaptive codecs that learn how to do better. I'm not certain those have actually been invented, but they ought to be invented because it must be a good idea. Because hey, the type of things problems codecs have are likely to be amenable to AI because uh, you can learn the patterns which give you problems. So let's, let's hope one or two of you set up a startup in that area. Okay, that's the end of this slide. Health bands. Here we have some comments on the enterprise uh, video conferencing uh, scenario. Uh, this is near the end of the pandemic panic, July 22nd. And um, this says that uh, if when in, in uh, when companies were surveys as to why they would increase their expenditures, effectively collaboration technologies was the uh, was the number one reason. Um, the other ones we have, we have clouds in here, um, mobile devices, bandwidth, networking, and things like that. Here we have the uh, vendors. Uh, some example of enter remember this is enterprise video, not consumer video. And most of these, I know, the dominant ones are BlueJeans, Zoom, WebEx, Google Meet, and I don't see Microsoft Teams, but it must be, oh, well, this is Microsoft Teams, sorry. All right, and here are reasons why um, 
people switched. Um, we will see on the next slide comments on security and Zoom, but uh, ease of use was the most important reason. Um, obviously, costs are relevant. And these other numbers are relatively small. Um, because the video conferencing systems nowadays work quite well. As I told you, I used to I had a startup in this area back in 20 years ago, 2000, and that suffered, that didn't make it, mainly due to the networking. In those days where WebEx managed to survive, we were not able to cope with the, with the uh, consequences of the poor networking, which not only led to lower bandwidth and lower quality, it actually called the, caused the system to break because it lost connection between the, the cloud, or in those days it wasn't called a cloud, the central system and the clients. And then you got um, situations where there was no longer properly synchronized between different clients. And that was all due to network problems. All right, now we come to the second slide on enterprise video conferencing. Uh, we know, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of concerns about security, which have possibly been largely addressed now by Zoom. They keep having uh, updates in their security support. And we know Tesla's vehemently uh, negative about uh, Zoom because of that. Uh, and there was 93% um, zero use and 7% um, decrease of use. And then we have other famous companies, Cisco obviously, and Cisco and Microsoft sh shouldn't be, or LinkedIn, which I think is owned by Microsoft, shouldn't be expected to use Zoom because they would use their, their own products. Um, but here, Square, Twitter, Salesforce, uh, or Netflix ought to be uh, less, um, shouldn't have that type of bias. Here we have a remarkable increase of the uh, use of Microsoft Teams, uh, obviously spurred by the pandemic. Until the pandemic, Microsoft Teams had actually been increasing significantly, although I must admit I hadn't even heard of it until the pandemic. Whereas I was very familiar with the Google, um, BlueJeans, Zoom, and WebEx solutions. Here we have the uh, five major um, vendors are compared in terms of um, number of people saying they'd use these products and the reason whether it was for personal or business. Notice Microsoft and Cisco are dominantly business solutions. Uh, Zoom, Google, and to a lesser extent, BlueJeans have a very significant personal use. Then we look at what the problems are. We see it's uh, communications or video quality which are closely related because uh, when you're designing uh, uh, a codec, you want to design it to be efficient. They need to represent the information in the smaller number of bits possible, but also you want to be robust so that if you lose frames, you don't destroy too much. And in fact, that's particularly serious for audio. audio the human eye is much more tolerant than the human ear. I remember in, in days gone by, I, I, I uh, used to study this quite, Seriously, because I had a startup in this area called Anabas, and it it essentially failed because of the quality of the network. We could not uh, cope with the poor quality network, which led to all sorts of problems when we tried to deploy our solution. And uh, the problem was not just the breakup of the video; it was actually the overall control. Because when you build these systems, you have uh, you have this, the media. But you also have the control, so that uh, each client knows which other clients they're talking to, and they have a common state. That's the, and if you lose a control message, you're in you're in real trouble. So we didn't get that correct. Other interesting things from those early days are companies like Real Player, which may still exist, but it's certainly not as dominant as it used to be. It used to be a very dominant player. And then there was the discussion between real time, like Zoom and, uh, and Hangouts and things, or asynchronous, where the asynchronous streaming, or sorry, called streaming, I should say, not asynchronous. There's asynchronous streaming real time. Real time is for conversations, less than you know, 
fraction of a second uh, latency. Streaming is for, for all in, instant downloads, so that's uh, say a five second latency. And then asynchronous can be days latencies. And they each have different trade offs. It's not you, a single codec will not do all of those because uh, they, they, uh, they require a different uh, technology to get each of those examples to work. So that's the end of uh, that. Uh, that this is our discussion of enterprise video conferencing. Thank you. All right, we have his back, back to vaccines. We know a few are being tested already, and we're not so certain. I mean, this treatment time is historically short, and I think that's partly because of the computer, the model for actually testing on the initial. Um, scans on the on the, with computers is much better developed now than it used to be, and here we have this 12 to 18 month number, and everybody is obviously involved. And this particular article didn't didn't do anything terribly exciting. It has some rather, in my opinion, not rather uh, difficult to believe uh, timelines. Not because they did a bad job, because I think nobody really knows what's going on. It will all depend how well these vaccines perform, either in terms of their safety, or more probably more importantly, just whether they stop the virus. Um, and here we have a slightly cautious report that you should read. I noticed this just in general, this particular report. And um, it just says that AI is still at the beginning, which is obvious. And as we'll see later on, we can have AI research involved in the diagnosis, the treatment, and also the study of the spread. We will go through these different classes of AI later on. But I actually haven't studied this particular uh, report in detail, but it's a good one if you're writing, doing a project, this is a good one to put on your reading list. I have an interesting Little little nugget. It's a, from relatively recently September of a collaboration between a company, one and company Philips and US DoD on uh, monitors, which would include monitors for COVID, but also other monitors, say for bioweapon uh, exposure and things like that, or even maybe worse, nuclear nuclear um, exposure. And uh, this project is called Rate Rapid Analysis of Threat Exposure, and it's um, basically effectively it's giving a name to what we have already discussed many times: the Internet of Medical Things. That there's a whole bunch of sensors which you wear on your, well, in this case, from the, on your on your military personnel, and they are fed back to your central cloud and analyzed to decide whether you're whether your uh, individual, the soldier, is uh, has some sort of uh, problem or other, but uh, there's very little detail here. But obviously, this is a good project and likely to to continue and possibly even expand because I I suspect this is very this there's just a lot of things you can use in the Internet of Medical Things. Now we have a set of slides on telemedicine, telehealth, um, remote uh, monitoring and things like that. And uh, this slide just has some very simple remarks about telemedicine, about uh, the different forms it can take. Um, it's uh, to say it claims that telemedicine is, is a subset of these solutions where there's a direct line of contact between the doctor and the uh, patient, and that so it probably has some real-time video or audio link, and um, <clears throat> there is these uh, asynchronous versions of it where you uh, take your photo of your eye and send the eye, and send that photo to the eye doctor, and so on, and so on. And there are many companies, Teladoc, MD Live, and others, which are. Uh, uh, Startups in this area, which is a very, very promising area, which can be expected to increase very significantly, and obviously, which the pandemic has given a boost to. 
All right, here we have the last two part of this uh, session is telehealth. Um, and uh, there is just a White House announcement about increasing access to digital health resources, which is effectively telling them to people to use telehealth more often. And so this is now the US president endorsing this particular idea. It comes from OSTP, which is an important office in the government. And um, this is, these are just comments from the um, the uh, various companies, the telehealth industry consortium, and Amazon Web Services, which is of course supporting supporting with a, a providing internet resources for advertising what's available and things like that. And I guess I guess this is actually explained on the government website. But I think it's interesting that telehealth has has got a strong endorsement for the government. So that's the end of uh, this a quick overview of different approaches to um, uh, to attacking the virus. So thank, and now we'll come back to, uh, in the next few sections uh, into uh, a couple of sections into the study of the actual detailed responses, which I'm familiar with. Thank you very much. All right, here is a, one of a set of slides on, on telemedicine and telehealth. And this one is technically telehealth, which is a broader concept than telemedicine by our definition. And here is showing that uh, actually in March, there was a very significant increase in the use of telehealth. and. Uh, this sort of contra here we have this survey, which is from August 2019, which shows that there's quite a lot of amenability to telehealth, although not so many have actually used it. Here at the age group that's most um, interested in telehealth, the younger group, 16% had tried it, and 74% were willing to give it a try. And only 26% were not so interested. So this just says that, uh, and we will see later slides showing that this increase is continuing, that this is a promising area which the world was waiting to explore anyway. Here we have some of the companies with different technologies, video telemedicine. That's, uh, remember telehealth becomes telemedicine when you have real time interactions with the physician. Kiosks. Uh, at the pharmacy, so that's uh, some technologies here with companies like Rite Aid um, um, communicating, I mean, hosting it. Then we have, you can just uh, send a message saying, I have bumps on my head, what does that mean to the, to the physician? Um, then we have um, specialists, uh, we saw some examples of that with stethoscopes at the other end of a telemedicine. Um, uh, session. And uh, here we can do uh, the example I gave before was a photo, photographing your eyes so that the eye doctor can have a look at them. So, or photograph your skin if you've got a rash or something like that. So there are lots of models and there are many, lots of examples here from small and large companies. Not all of them, most of which I do not know. I know Rite Aid, but I don't know the other companies mentioned here. Here we do see the growth, if this one has gone through June, and we've got the growth continuing to grow, continuing up. And um, here's, that's for um, US adults who've used telemedicine, they're almost a third and by June. And here we have physicians who have done virtual consultations, 80% by July. So that uh, actually says it's dominant, and it's sort of interesting. This is a dramatic increase from March 9%. So this is a huge, a huge change on the physician side. It's just this become. I mean, that doesn't say 80% liked it. It just says 80% did it. Here we have a couple of charts which uh, basically tell us a bit about how the, the medical industry reviews telehealth. On this one here, we have um, a survey which asks what uh, what effect will have the greatest impact on the health care landscape in the next year. Then here we have telehealth sitting here at 
whereas of course the loss of money due to the pandemic and uh, delayed elective surgeries and things like that is actually having more impact. May not be more important, but it ha might have more impact. Uh, impact of delayed care, that's pretty serious. Whereas things like um, <clears throat> decline in, in insurance enrollment is not so big. Here on this other chart here, we have um, a survey as to where telehealth will be most important, with routine care of chronic conditions being the dominant uh, category. I'm a bit surprised these follow-up categories are more, more important. I would think it's precisely be really good as follow-up. Monitoring the uh, particular medical in in in, in person uh, session. Here we have mental health, and here we have COVID screening. So. Now here's this company, Doximity, which has a pretty good uh, state of telemedicine report. I recommend you try to look at that. I've only really done a very tiny uh, Part of this is full of charts, and um, it has numbers like, um, whereas before COVID, we saw this number 14% had done telemedicine. Now it's significantly uh, higher with 35% uh, uh, of people with chronic conditions saying they'd use tele telemedicine or telehealth. Um, so, 28% they think the telemedicine's the same or better quality. Well, actually, those with a chronic illness think that 53% of those feel it's the same or better. And um, they, uh, there's a 67% of patients felt that this was a positive and acceptable substitute. And there's lots of fresh data in this toximity report, which break up these responses by categories of doctors and things like that. Now we come to a discussion of something related to telemedicine and telehealth, namely mobile health, which is using your smartphone and things to, uh, or your smartwatch to deliver things. And here we have a smartwatch, and uh, where we have these, I think, are actually probably from, from these are from the Apple. The, the Series 6, the latest Apple release, has these uh, new sensors on it. And Apple has obviously done extremely well here, and were very clever in identifying the health uh, implications of smartwatches. It surprises me that mm, that's not been more aggressively pursued by the Android component of the smartphone industry. Um, there are some, some Android ventures in this area, but they're not nearly as successful as Apple. And I don't quite understand why. The, the phones are quite successful. Why would the watches not work? Uh, I think it's just lack. I guess they're so consumed with chasing the jugular of the of the actual smartphone, they haven't bothered on these important uh, um, features that watches can add. Because it probably is true that the watch on its own is not so exciting, but the watch plus a health monitor is um, uh, important. And of course, Google is trying to purchase Fitbit. And um, well, it's not quite, it says here Alphabet or Google owned Fitbit, but that actually hasn't closed yet. And um, although I read today, uh, September 29th or whatever it is, the European Union had tentatively approved that purchase. And usually the EU is the hardest, hardest hurdle to jump because they're pretty stickly for regulation. And here we have um, a related thing to mHealth, namely, Monitoring uh, illnesses like diabetes, and I have one for blood pressure. And um, obviously, we know there are lots of these devices here which we can monitor all these things. And um, obviously, the, there's a lot of merging between telehealth and and um, the remote patient monitoring. And that, that in fact, you can't really do. Telehealth without remote patient monitoring, but you can do remote patient monitoring without telehealth because you can send it back to the doctor who just contacts you or tells you the consequences of your real time feeds uh, at the next visit. And there's not only Apple and uh, Fitbit, 
There's many other things. GE, GE is a major player for a long time in medical instrumentation. I do not know a live core or biofumus. And here we have the last slide in this general area. Um, we have personal emergency response systems, which are, which are an aspect of telehealth. And uh, obviously, this is for monitoring, especially elderly patients who, 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 if they're on their own and they have a problem, that needs to be communicated. And that uh, will be uh, some monitor that has a direct line to some caregiver, uh, which uh, either is automatically or by patient request uh, initiated. Uh, and this is expected to grow, but it's also probably likely to merge with these RPM devices, because the same elderly also want RPM devices. And so I'm not quite certain this is a genuinely separate uh, concept. But still, it's all pretty interesting.